Excellent. All righty. Well, thank you everybody so much for being here today for our exercise oncology education week. My my name is Julia Dawn and I'm a PhD student in the health and wellness lab, as well as a clinical exercise physiologist helping to lead some of our awesome programs that uh, Dr. Kulos Regis took us through. In today's half an hour presentation, we're going to be going over the exercise oncology guidelines and how we can go from prescription and the evidence we know about exercise and put it into practice. So at the end of today's presentation, we're all going to have a little bit of homework for ourselves um, so we can actually put what we're learning today into practice. So what we'll talk about today is an overview of the evidence for exercise and cancer. We're going to talk about what the recommended guidelines are for cancer patients and survivors, and then we'll go into how we can implement these guidelines into the real world setting, and then we're going to practice at the very end. A couple of key terms that you may have just heard in Nicole's presentation, but you may hear me interchangeably use the words movement, physical activity, and exercise. When we talk about movement, we simply talk about mo moving, moving our bodies, not being sedentary. We can kind of think of it as an umbrella term under which can fall physical activity, which is any bodily movement that's produced by our muscles that results in energy expenditure. And then we have exercise, which is another subset of physical activity, which is structured and planned, often done in a way um, with a specific goal in mind, often with a fitness goal in mind. So you may hear me referring to movement, physical activity, and exercise throughout today's presentation. And that's just a brief introduction to what each of those um, mean. So exercise for cancer. We know what the past two decades of research has shown us is that exercise for cancer survivors and patients is both safe and beneficial across the entire cancer continuum. And when we talk about the cancer continuum, we mean everywhere from pre-treatment to during treatment. So things like surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and palliative care is needed to post-treatment, so into rehabilitation or maintenance therapy as needed, and then into survivorship and advanced cancer care. What our research has shown us is that exercise is beneficial and safe across all of these time points. And that's what we refer to as the cancer continuum. So specifically, why exercise? Why engage in movement across this timeline? First of all, for symptom management, for things like cancer-related fatigue, that's our number one most important side effect across all cancers, for lymphedema, for our bone health, for our body composition. So a number of these, um, of these outcomes can be impacted by treatments that we undergo, surgery, chemo radiation, and by aging as well. So exercise can help us both maintain um, and improve our symptoms and uh, treatment-related side effects that we might experience across this cancer continuum. Exercise is also important for fitness changes or maintaining your fitness abilities. And this can be your aerobic fitness, so your cardiorespiratory fitness, your heart health, uh, your strength or your resistance training, so maintaining our strong and healthy muscles and bones, and then our flexibility and our mobility to keep us nice and healthy, our, our joints um, moving fluidly, um, and keeping our body kind of moving like a well-oiled machine. And then for overall well-being, for our physical well-being, for our psychosocial well-being, so our emotional well-being, our social well-being, and then our quality of life as well. So exercise can have important implications for all of these important components. And we're going to start, uh, take a second to focus on uh, one example, which is cancer-related fatigue, which we talked about is oftentimes our number one most reported side effect, um, and what the role of exercise can play for cancer-related fatigue. And what we have on the slide here is what we call the vicious cycle of fatigue. And oftentimes what happens when we're fatigued is we become more sedentary. So less movement, more physical, less physical activity. And what happens is that results in deconditioning or, um, or muscle atrophy. So muscle wasting, we're not using those muscles, we're more sedentary, and that can in turn make us more fatigued. And then we fall into this kind of vicious cycle of fatigue. But the good news is with this is that exercise or physical activity can help us improve our energy and decrease our fatigue. There have been a number of high quality studies that have been conducted in this area, one of which is Oberol et al. And what they did was they looked at 123 studies that examined the role of physical activity for fatigue. And they found that across all of these 123 studies, physical activity reduced fatigue severity. And this effect didn't differ based upon patient or intervention characteristics, which tells us that exercise or physical activity is a beneficial tool that can be applied universally across all patients and survivors that are experiencing cancer-related fatigue. 
Of course, we need to tailor and individualize our movement or our physical activity to make sure that we're, we're moving in a way that feels good for us. And we'll talk a little bit about more, more about that in just a couple moments. Another spotlight for prostate cancer, um, another research spotlight is for prostate cancer. And a study conducted by Walt and colleagues found that uh, in, when we combine uh, aerobic training and resistance training for about three days per week, they found that there was an improve, improvement in patients' aerobic fitness, their body composition. So they saw an increase in lean muscle mass. So that's the, that's our muscle. So increase in our, uh, in our muscles in our body and improved management of blood sugar levels and resting metabolic rate. And they found this when they combined those two Two different types of movements three times per week which is about 150 120 minutes per week they saw these improvements to their physical well-being which is pretty cool to think about how physical activity can have that power another research study spotlight in breast cancer by uh, colleagues ibrahim and all found that physical activity after diagnosis for breast cancer patients has been associated with reduced risk of breast cancer recurrence or breast cancer coming back and breast cancer specific mortality. And what they looked at was um, a number of studies where they pulled the data and found that exercise post diagnosis was associated with a 34% lower risk of death, deaths caused by breast cancer, 41% lower risk of all cause mortality, and a 24% lower risk of breast cancer recurrence which again speaks to this power of physical activity and exercise and how when we engage in that exercise, we can have some pretty powerful effects for not just our overall well-being, but for our survival as well. In summary, the evidence in exercise oncology shows that it's beneficial and safe for both our physical well-being and our psychosocial well-being. And what's important to note here is that there's no negative impacts and it does not undermine our treatment efficacy. So if we're getting surgery, uh, chemotherapy, radiation, um, hormone therapy, exercise when prescribed in a way that feels good and works for us is not going to undermine that treatment. These differences will also depend on where we are on that cancer continuum that we saw at the beginning of the slides here and on your personal preferences, your health status, your fitness levels, and we'll get to that in just a couple moments here. Um, all of this will depend based on you, your preferences, and where you are along that continuum. So let's jump right in. And what does that mean? The general guidelines when we speak to exercise oncology um, can be applied in a number of different ways. And we'll talk about those different, uh, different specifications in a moment. But generally speaking, during treatment, exercise is important for improving your physical functioning, fatigue, and quality of life. And generally, we, we talk to avoiding inactivity to help us return to those activities of daily living, that normal life, as soon as possible following a diagnosis. After treatment, exercise becomes really important for a recovery and gaining back those fitness um, changes that may have occurred during our cancer treatment. And then across this entire continuum, it's important that we tailor and individualize it to our age, our disease status, our tumor type, our previous fitness levels, our overall health status, tailoring it to the type of social support we may have, and the access to resources and programs that we have as well. Let's get a little bit more specific now and talk about the American uh, College for Sports Medicine's guidelines. Uh, these initially came out back in 2012 and they were recently updated in 2019 with specific guidelines for the different types of movements or activities that are important for patients, cancer patients and survivors to engage in across the cancer continuum. The ACSM guidelines recommend that all cancer patients and survivors aim for about 90 minutes of aerobic exercise per week at about a moderate intensity. So aerobic exercise, again, is that cardiorespiratory fitness training. So working our heart muscles, that cardio exercise. So things like walking, swimming, biking, jogging, dancing in your living room, anything that's going to increase your heart rate a little bit. That's our aerobic exercise. And we're aiming for about 90 minutes of that at a moderate level throughout the week. In addition to that, it's recommended that patients and survivors aim for about two days of strength training per week. So that's our resistance training when we're working uh, against gravity to strengthen our muscles and our bones. And so that can look like a number of different things. You may see uh, people using weights for this, resistance bands, and you might already be doing this in your daily life when you're standing on one leg, getting dressed for the day, sitting up and down from your couch a couple of times. Anything that we're using to strengthen our muscles and bones is our strength training. And then there's our flexibility training, which is encouraged 
to engage in throughout the entire week on most days of the week. And this is things like yoga, stretching, deep breathing, rolling your shoulders. Whenever we're kind of challenging that mobility, that range of motion in our body, that's our flexibility training that we're aiming to do a little bit of every single day. So we talked about what we want to include. Let's talk about how hard. What is the um, effort or exertion we're aiming for when we're incorporating these types of movements into our daily lives? Some of you may be familiar with the scale. It's our rating of perceived exertion scale. And you can see how it goes from zero to 10. Zero being we're not perceiving much effort that we're exerting. Kind of like we're all sitting here right now listening to this presentation. We're kind of at that zero mark, or maybe 0 0.5, maybe if you're stand, standing watching this presentation today. 10 is on the opposite side of the spectrum. So that's our absolute maximum exertion we could ever imagine. The most strenuous exercise. This is where a bear is chasing you. You couldn't go any harder than that. Five is somewhere in the middle. It's our heavy exercise. It feels difficult, but we don't have a problem continuing. What's recommended for cancer survivors is somewhere in that two to six range, that light to hard. And the reason why we recommend a two to six rating of perceived exertion scale when we're engaging in our activities is because the research shows that when we engage between that two to six range, we can feel more energized after exercise and less fatigued. And of course, this is going to depend on uh, our daily lives, whether we had treatment that day, whether we we had a good sleep that night or maybe a worse sleep that night or if we're just feeling crummy for another reason um, when we're feeling more tired or not as good then usually sticking to that one or even two out of three two or three out of ten range tends to be where we want to be so that we do feel more energized after exercise on the days where we're feeling really good we were feeling energized um, we're feeling good and we're ready to move a little bit harder then we can look at maybe that five or six maybe that four out of ten rating of perceived exertion during our activities and then on the days where we're kind of in the middle and then we can aim for that maybe three or four out of ten where we're feeling not the best not the worst but somewhere in the middle the reason why we follow these, these guidelines for two to six um, is that we can feel the optimal benefits of movement. And it's important that when we look at these guidelines and we looked at, look at uh, what's recommended to engage in throughout the week, and when we look at what's, how hard it's recommended to engage in throughout the week, it's important to recognize that those are just guidelines. And at the end of the day, we have to do what feels good for us. We're choosing movements and intensities of movements that feel good for us things that we love to do, things that we're good at, and things that are gonna make us feel good at the end of the day. And that's where this, this uh, component of individualization and tailoring um, comes into play. It's gonna depend on your current fitness level, your gender, your age, your social support circle. So your friends, your family, your coworkers that are involved in your life, and then your access to programs and resources. And then what's really important is your preferences. So if you love to garden, if you love to go walking, if you love to play baseball or go swimming, and then considering any barriers or obstacles you may have to exercise as well. So if you know that you have more energy in the mornings than at night, kind of looking at that and saying, you know what, in the mornings I feel best, and that's what I'm going to um, add in my movement. At the end of the day, we know that everybody can get here, but the path might look different, and everybody's um, movement will be different. Uh, depending on your diagnosis, your overall health status, no situation will be the same. The main message is to sit less and move more. And that's where that term of movement really comes into play because we can engage in our squats or our structured exercise movements in our Excel and ACE classes and our Thrive programs. But what we're, what we're really trying to achieve is more movement in our lives, whether it's five minutes or 10 minutes or even one minute. One minute is better than zero minutes and five minutes is better than one minute. And while we have those guidelines to aim at 90 minutes per week, doesn't mean we have to start there. We can start at two minutes and that's better than nothing. So what can movement look like? This is the fun part where we get to practice a little bit. So I encourage all of you to find a nice comfortable seated position or if you wanna come standing, you can do that too. And we're gonna start by just rolling out our shoulders. Just bringing up those shoulders to our ears and slowly letting them go back, opening up through that chest and maybe sinking in our breath with this movement here. So inhaling as we reach those shoulders to our ears, exhaling to let them go back. And if this is feeling good, maybe we're making these arm movements a little bit bigger. If that feels like too much, you just pull back a little bit. Always stay within your comfortable range of motion. Nice. Okay, I'm loving how everybody's joining in on this. Okay, if this is 
is feeling good, maybe we come into a little side to side stretch, stretching over to the right, feeling that nice stretch along the left hand side of our body, and then switching to the other side. Does anybody notice an instant change in energy just from these couple shoulder rolls? I'm feeling a little bit more revived. Okay, if that's feeling good, maybe we reach the arms up to the ceiling and then down and then back up. Awesome. Okay, good. Now, if that's feeling good, you can try some sit to stand. So this one, I know you all do this every single day. We're sitting on our chair. We're going to take it up to standing a couple times here if this is feeling good. If that chair feels like it's a little bit too far today, then you just go a quarter of the way. Maybe a little pulse. You don't have to go all the way up and down. And look at this, you're doing squats, you're doing sit to stand, you're strengthening your quads, your core, getting your heart rate a little bit elevated. Amazing. So movement can look like a number of different things. It doesn't have to be wearing uh, gym clothes and putting on your um, running shoes to go outside. And if you love that, that's amazing. But movement can sometimes just be simply moving with your breath rolling your shoulders when you're waiting for your appointment um, at the office at your doctor's office doing some stretches some calf raises sit to stands i love how some of you are still moving yes keep moving um, and what's important is to look at your your daily life what you love to do and where you can add in more movement in a way that looks and feels good for you another way that we can help put these guidelines into practice is to tap into some of the resources that are available. And I know Nicole just spoke to a lot of these in the previous presentation, so I'll cover them quickly here for us now. But we have a number of resources through the Health and Wellness Lab and in the wider Calgary community. The first one being our Alberta Cancer and Exercise Program. So that's for all cancer patients and survivors within three years of treatment in uh, living in major urban areas across Alberta. Then we have our Excel, Exercise for Cancer and to Enhance Living Well program. It's the same framework as ACE, but it's for all Canadians living in remote or rural areas. For both of those, you can find more information at thriveforcancersurvivors.com, and I'll paste the link in the chat box at the end of this. We also have a YouTube channel through the Health and Wellness Lab where we post a number of videos, everything from instructional videos on how to perform specific exercises to 20, 30, 40 minute exercise circuits. Stay tuned for this one because we're building this one up and soon you'll be able to follow along um, a full 12 week program on there as well. And then what you also would have heard about in the previous presentation is our Thriver Manual of Thrive Health services. This is an amazing resource. It's about 100 pages. It's 90 plus pages. And it covers everything from what we're talking about today to um, how to implement this some behavior change, how to uh, communicate with your healthcare team. It's really a wellness manual to support you um, as patient survivors and support persons across the entire cancer continuum. And then there's also Wellspring Calgary, which is an amazing community, not just exercise, um, but a community for patient survivors and their support persons, where they offer a number of programs, everything from exercise to bird watching and between. It's really an amazing resource for support across the entire cancer continuum. So here's the second fun part of what we get to do today. This is our homework. We're going to make an action plan to move more. So I encourage you to grab a pen and a paper or your phone um, or your computer, or you can write in the chat box here. And I want you to take the next 60 seconds to just look at your current, uh, current week from between now and next Monday and see where you can schedule in some movement. Writing it down makes us more likely to actually have it happen. And here's our bonus point. If you write in the chat box or tell someone about your plan to move more, we're even more likely to make it happen as well because we're tapping into that social support, that accountability piece. So take the next 60 seconds to write down how you're gonna move more, whether it's an exercise class, whether it's a commercial break workout, whether it's a few extra sit to stay, Stands, when you're waiting for uh, your coffee to brew or in the, when you're watching your favorite movie, uh, whether it's a balance exercise when you're pumping your gas, I'm going to stop talking for 60 seconds and you write down how you're going to move more over the next week. And I see some, uh, some coming into the chat box here. Let me just open this up. Amazing. Okay, so next up, Nicole's going to yoga. Yes, that absolutely counts. Uh, Sarah's going for a walk every day. Beautiful. Margo's biking. York 
yard work, Excel. Oh my gosh, yard work is an amazing way to move. I was raking my leaves last weekend. Well, not this one, the week before when we had 19 degrees in Calgary. It's such a good workout. Yes, McKenna, I love that. Getting up every hour and doing some sit to stands. That's a great idea. Manat is going biking tomorrow before Excel. Nice, Alan. All movement counts. More dog walks with Kelly. Oh, amazing. Walking your local high school track. I love to hear what everybody's coming up with, tapping into what's available to you. Parks, like local high school tracks. That's amazing. Kate's doing her ACE classes this week. Then she's going for a walk. Then she's got yoga. Amazing. Golfing. Dancing in the morning. Okay, that's part of my routine. So I feel you there, Sarah. Yoga. Oh, Pilates. Okay, team. So I think all of you can be delivering this presentation because all of you um, know exactly the importance of moving more and how we can do it. And what I love about all of these comments that are coming in is that they're specific. You're saying um, what you're going to do, how long you're going to do it. And a lot of you are involving your friends and your family in it as well. So that's amazing. Bonus points to all of you for tapping into social support and for writing it down. Keep it coming. I'm going to move into our next slide here, but amazing. I love, I love to hear how active everybody's going to be over the next week. The main message and the take home messages from that I'm hoping you can leave today's presentation with is that everyone can move and it's about finding ways that feel good for us. And movement is beneficial for everyone across all time points of that cancer continuum. It's all about sitting less and moving more. So that person that said that they're sitting all day and finding a way to move every hour on the hour, brilliant. Finding ways that we can tap into our lifestyles and what can work for us is the key to moving more. So amazing job there. Starting low and progressing slow. So again, looking back at those guidelines, if you're already meeting them, fantastic. If you're not quite there yet, that's also great. Start with where you are and move up from there. And then try to incorporate all types of activity into your weekly life. Some aerobic training, so cardio, some strength training, and flexibility. Thinking of ways that you can include all three of those movements into your weekly life. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please feel free to reach out to us at wellnesslab at ucalgary.ca. Um, and if you want to uh, stay accountable with your movement plans over the next week, please feel free to send me a message as well. I'd love to hear about it. Um, and I'll open up the floor now to questions and uh, thoughts and comments. Emma's going to stop the